A very warm welcome to you from Equa Marketing. This presentation is brought to you by Equa.com, a leader in digital marketing. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Growing Dentist. Once again, I'm so delighted to have Dr. Peter Evans, a friend, a client, and someone I look up to a lot. Dr. Evans is a successful dentist who has been practicing for a long time, and um, I've heard him speak, and I've been inspired by lots of the ideas he has. Not only does he practice full-time and um, has a very good practice you know, uh, that has grown over the years, but also he helps other dentists uh, with a business called biocompatibledentist.com. Dr. Peter, I'm so glad to have you today, and uh, why don't we start by you telling our listeners a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, great. Uh, I'd love to do that. And, and Naren, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Um, uh, all, all the years that we've talked, I know we've had lots of conversations, but this, this, this time we're going to talk to other people. So it'll be fun, I think. Um, uh, m- my story started um, back in graduate school when I was uh, in microbiology and I was learning about uh, uh, actually, uh, research involved in uh, inflammation and infection. And so when I finally got to dental school, it just played right into the hands of periodontal disease. So I've always been interested in what's, what's, what's going on with, with the body, what's going on with the host, what's going on with the causal agents and in, in what's happening. So dental school was a lot of fun for me. I had a lot of fun. Uh, we went through dental school. It It's... Uh, trying and, and a, a horrible experience for a lot of students, but we had a great time. Um, and when I got out of dental school, I joined up with an, uh, a little bit older dentist, um, and we had in that practice, uh, hygiene appointments were like 45 minutes apiece. Didn't matter whether you were a prophy or you had periodontal disease, it was 45 minutes apiece. And then, and that bothered me a little bit, but um, and I, I was young, I didn't know, but his management style on how he approached his patients and especially how he approached his staff, um, he would be upset, throw instruments, he would dress them down and make them cry, take them into the laboratory and kind of yell at them, and that just wasn't my style. So we parted ways uh, after a while, two years, it took me to, to wise up, and then. Uh, I moved back to my hometown um, because of family and started my own practice uh, with no patients at all. And I I vowed I was going to learn how to talk to my patients uh, in the language of the patients uh, about what mattered to the patients. And so from there, I learned um, uh, much more of my dentistry with the Academy of General Dentistry to get my mastership award in the Academy of General Dentistry, took a, a fair amount of courses in, in uh, communications. And since that time, uh, I think we all can understand that, that dentistry has changed from a commodity of, of, hey, I fix teeth and treat gums to it's a relationship business of where we are treating people and helping them along their path to health. So. Um, that was my struggle a long time ago on being in a practice that was just all about teeth and gums. We were like tooth carpenters, and and uh, that didn't sit well with me. But um, I know, you know, we're not much of the branch of the healing arts anymore either. That's gone by the wayside. So there's there's got to be a happy medium of um, purpose and the things that you talk about, Naren, purpose and life, uh, and money, and time, and relationships, these things that, that the broad, uh, your podcast is all about. Um, so the relationships ha- hit home with me. So I spent the last 17 years kind of developing, what are the verbal skills? What are the verbal scripts? What, you know, How do you treat people coming into the office? And um, we've come up with uh, uh, quite a bit of, of innovative ways, actually, to, um, to help kind of the relationship business of patient doctors and um, not so much about um, money and time and things like that. But on the relationship side, um, it's 
it's, it, it actually becomes a very profitable business model when you do that to to, to grow your business, um, thinking about uh, your relationships with patients uh, rather than um, uh, the time and the scheduling book and, and all of that. That's all part of it, but it's uh, it's much more important to for me. It's much more important to uh, understand the the new patient because you know they don't they're not going to buy into your solutions if if they don't feel understood to begin with you don't get somebody to buy to get a you know $20,000 case just because you're showing them the laser that you bought last month so um let's let's talk more about the relationships if you want to that would be fine with me yeah i mean this is a fascinating doctor just a couple of things i picked up just listening to you is um First, you said it's about the people, right? I mean, dentistry and and you know uh, and and what you do and all of that stuff is great, but at the end of the day, there's a human on the other side, and it's all about you know you know making that making that person uh, feel like they're heard and you know um, helping them and 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 helping them achieve what they want. The other thing you mentioned is you know maybe we'll get to it later if we have time is, is you know the way you treat your own people your own team and uh, you know this experience you had in your first uh, you know first time practicing you know under somebody else I, I guess it would have really shook you to the core you know seeing people cry and all that stuff and you know being dressed down in publicly and you know so um so i'm sure it probably helped you shape shape you the person you became so um let's jump right in in terms of you know, patience and relationships. And the third thing I noticed is, um, you know, the, I, I love the phrase that says, overnight success, 15 years in the making. And sometimes to get clarity, sometimes, um, you know, to really, really get to the essence, you need to go through the pain and you need to kind of do it for a very long time. So you have been doing it for a very long time. And uh, yeah, so why don't we start with the patient? And, and, uh, and let's start you know, the relationship with the patient. Do you want to start at the very beginning, meaning somebody finds out about you and the phone rings? Like, how do you want to go about talking about relationships? Yeah, I think I think you've got to talk about the relationships, uh, and not so much when the phone rings, because there's a time when you've got your uh, reputation out there already. I mean, you're not you're not even present, and the and the and the new patient is picking up the phone. They've talked to their neighbor. They've seen your advertisement. Something has happened to make them make that phone call. You know, it's just not like um, uh, 10 o'clock in the morning and and they're just going to call your office to see what you're up to today. How's it going? I mean, there's a purpose, and they want to see some kind of result or some kind of uh, small victory that they they can achieve by calling your um, office. So your, your, your telephone is the most important business tool that you have, and hopefully your receptionist understands that. Her, her job is not to answer the phones. Her job is to make appointments, to sell appointments. That's her job description. So right. you don't have a whole lot of control over that uh, external um, referral source out there. Uh, you know, your curb appeal, all those things can matter. But the fact is that once a new patient calls, um, they are already uh, leaning towards wanting to trust you. They are already leaning that way. So it's a great place to start. If you've got a talented front desk that knows how to answer the phones, makes the appointments, all those verbal scripts, that's wonderful. I can't I can't help anybody uh, trying to get new patients in, in the front door. But once that patient is in the front door, there, there are uh, uh, ways that you can grow your practice. Uh, actually, t- Two other ways to grow your your practice once the patient is in the front door. So, out of the three ways to grow your business, um, most of us think, well, I just need more new patients. I need more new patients. I only get 18 new patients a month. I only get 25 new patients. I need more new patients to grow my business. Well, there's two more ways to grow your business, and the first one is just get more new patients. Second one is to get your patients to spend more. Uh, in other words, increase the average transactional value per patient. And the third way is to get patients to come back to the office more often. In, in other words, increase your transaction frequency per patient. And when you're in a relationship business, you can maximize those last two um, ways to grow your business. Uh, 
with the new patients that you're getting already. So it's, it's extremely valuable to understand the relationship of once that new patient is in the office, what happens then? So there are opportunities when that new patient walks in the front door as to what happens. What, what's the scripting from the front desk? There's opportunities once that patient is brought back for the, the exam. And in the exam, most dentists are just going to pick up the, um, the uh, uh, x-rays and the photographs and the mirror and explore, and they're going to start the exam. But after that, I think the next thing to do is they're going to tell them how they're going to fix their teeth. Now, we didn't, you know, we didn't have to learn this in dental school. I think, I think a lot of us still might use the methods that we learned in dental school for case presentation and examination, um, but, but those were developed for institutional or, or the academic environment. That's not for private practice. Um, so when we bring those methods into our own office and we do a case presentation based on our dental school experience, well, it's, it's not much of, a, of, a, of, a, of an issue to present a case to a dental school uh, clinic patient because they weren't there for a long-term relationship, neither were you, um, because you needed credits to graduate. So when you proposed your care to a, a dental school patient, um, they, they better accept it because if they didn't, I mean, it's just like it didn't take much talent to, to propose and, and get case presentation to a dental school. We had to memorize the teeth and the quadrants and, the, and all the treatment. If they didn't accept, they were out the door, and you were on to the next patient that need the partial denture or the root canal or the crown. So they needed inexpensive dentistry. You needed credits to graduate. Relationships had nothing to do with it. Now, in private practice, it is critical to have that relationship. So there's ways to leave the mirror and explore on the bracket tray for a little while and uh, open up a conversation with the patient. And then there's another special way to propose treatment that solves the patient's problems by the patient's way of thinking using your best option dental care. Now, that's, that's what private practice needs right now, not the dental school um, uh, methodology of proposing the case and getting the case accepted. So it's that, that's a relationship building. The only thing that still remains the same is you've got to go through all the, di the diagnostics. And, and you know, we, we've, we've labeled the seven diagnostic disciplines as um, what we need to look at for whole body dentistry these days instead of just, hey, I'll... I'll fix a tooth for you. You know, here's your here's your treatment plan. Here's the case presentation. This is how I'm going to fix your teeth, Mrs. Jones. That's um, not a relationship model at all. And um, the way that you the way that you can go through all these steps is just to have more of an awareness of what kind of conversations do you want to have with the patient to begin with, or do you just walk in and say, "Here I am. I'm the dentist. Let's go. It's time." And it all revolves around you instead of revolving around the patient. So um, it's it's. I think universally we're, we're we are now kind of recycling up and down to go back to be more of a of a patient centered uh, uh, profession. And I'm all for it. So um, uh, that's how that's how I see it. And you know, from from thirty thousand feet, that's how I see it, that it should happen. Absolutely. This is interesting, Doctor. So you're saying, you know, when you're at dental school, you know, like you said, these people want inexpensive dentistry and the dentist wants credit. So it's a different world. It's like, you know, living in a you know, different world, not the reality of private practice. And what you learn there is very different, especially if you want to have a practice um, where people appreciate what you do and pay for what you do and you know, thank you for what you do. It's a totally different ball game, right? Yeah, relationship didn't matter. It's like uh, a marriage made out of convenience. Here, <laughs> you know, people have a choice, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. they don't have to. They, I mean, they're hard-earned dollars, and uh, you know, they really don't have to do anything with you. They have a choice, and uh, so the question is, 
why should they choose you? Why should they really choose you for that one thing that they are, you know, waiting and talking to you about, but also f- hopefully for the rest of their lives as their dentist? Well, and, um, you touched on a couple of points about, you know, it's not about you, it's about them. I would love to kind of be a fly on the wall and learn more about, you know, kind of how do you go about thinking about this or doing it? You know, just I'm so fascinated by what you're saying. Well, so the, the, the first thing is you have to make sure that the patient is the center of, of attention at, at, at the new patient appointment. Um, and so once the new patient is in the office and you have that opportunity that you're, you're, if your staff can do this for us, Naren, it's, it's um, like preheating the patient to kind of get in the mood of they're going to be taken care of very well. So there's a lot of verbal scripts and a lot of verbal skills that can be developed to um, have that new patient feel so welcomed into your practice. So that, that's a whole set of, of uh, um, kind of, um, uh, Can you give us an I guess. For, How do you welcome somebody where they feel so welcome? Can you just talk about that a little bit more? Well, some of the first things are is that you know you've got to find the person's name, right? If you start a conversation, somebody says, "Hey, I need my teeth cleaned," and you say, "Well, you know, have you been here before?" And well, we have an appointment next week. I can get you in at two o'clock. Would that be okay? Um, but you never find the person's name, um, it's, a, it's a huge mistake. The, somebody's name is, is indelibly in, embedded in their psyche, so you've right. got to find that for a name. So immediately when somebody says, hey, you know, I, 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 need a, I, I broke a tooth, I need a crown, and he says, well, you know, when was the last time you were in to see Dr. Evans? He says, oh, I'm, I'm not a patient. Oh, well, then, you know, my name's Leslie and yours. You know, immediately start the relationship. Don't be in your agenda. Be in their agenda. Their, you know, our agenda is not their agenda right now. So, right. you know, we've got we've got to uh, start the conversation. So, once you have that uh, person's name, use it a couple of three times. Then, uh, not only get their name, but give them a positive result. Give them something that they can grab onto, like. Get them in that, that afternoon. Whatever, they, whatever will give them a small victory, give it to them. And then lastly, make the appointment. That might be the small victory they're, they're looking at. But once they're in the office, there are things that can go on about simple things like um, if, a, if, if a clinical assistant is uh, going to go out and get the patient in the reception room, well, first of all, you know, extend your hand and things like that. But a simple thing like don't lead them down the hallway. Walk side by side with them as in uh, sharing the space. And then um, – and there's probably ten other different small things just like that before they get to uh, a consultation room or the treatment room. But once they're in the treatment room, you're Actually, probably going to want – Before you continue, I just wanted to ask you some – Clarifying questions. You mentioned two things. Uh, one you thing you said is uh, give them a small victory. I just want to understand the science or, or what, why you're saying this. And second thing you mentioned is, you know, don't lead them. Walk side by side. I'm sure you've thought about this a lot. Would yeah. love to understand why you're saying these things. Um, small victories. So, so between the time that the first phone call comes in and the time that they accept treatment, there has got to be small victories and, and, and positive results so the patient can say, yes, it's worth me continuing this conversation in this office with these lovely people, with this understanding dentist. And by the time you're done with that whole grid work like that, like the new patient grid, by the time you're done with that, the patient's going to say, yes, this guy understands me. His staff is here to take care of me, and, and, and he is recommending things that are in my best interest. Now, um, that right. all happens when you have a small conversation with the patient. That doesn't happen just because you're walking down the, uh, the, uh, the hallway with the patient. That's just a... a 
positive result that the patient feels um, not isolated anymore. So when the, when the patient gets into the treatment room, instead of picking up the Mirren Explorer, um, so you what, can what ask... Can just, to, just, to, just to summarize what I understood out of what you told me. So you're saying the reason small victories are important is it's not about you, it's about them, right? So yes. they need to feel that it's about them. And one way they do that is when they see these victories, you know, I, you know, it's about me and I, 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 you know, and, and thank you, thank you. I mean, they may not be out loud saying it, but that's the way they feel. And then you talked about walking side by side and you mentioned they're not walking alone, you're walking with them. So again, it goes back to that point about it's not about you trying to sell them things. It's really about them, and 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 you are just helping them, and you are like caring for them, and and you are for them. So they are at the center of the universe. Am I understanding what you're saying correctly? Exactly. Yeah. Perfect. Now you can do that. You can do that with your gestures or with a verbal skills. Like, um, uh, you know. Uh, each one of these touches is a positive result for the patient to continue with you because they're seeing benefits in this. Um, so the, after after you've got this tremendous opportunity that your patient, your, your staff can preheat this this patient for you, literally, by the time they get into the um, treatment room, if all you do is pick up a mirror and explore and start poking around, that's one thing. But there's a series of questions that you can you can start a patient uh, conversation, an, an, an interview, uh, whatever you want to call it. But you can start it by once you're you're introduced to the new patient. In other words, that's and that's another thing, Naren. So when you get into that situation and you meet the new patient, first of all, the inter, the the new patient is not introduced to the doctor. The doctor is introduced to the new patient, and that's important because. It's not like, you know, okay, hey, I'm in the room now. We can all start like I'm here. I'm the big guy. You walk in, and it's like you're meeting an old friend, like uh, you're being introduced to the new patient, but you meet it like uh, it's a chance, uh, uh, a meeting of an old friend. It's that kind of comfortable um, uh, kind of atmosphere that you want to d to, to kind of evolve in this. and. So your first question that might be with a new patient okay. after you are... So who is being introduced to who? Is it the patient being introduced? I just, I just want to make sure I didn't miss that. Oh, um, no, why? the patient is not the, the patient is not introduced to the doctor. It's the doctor is being introduced to the patient. Doctor is introduced to the patient. The patient is the star right now. And it's simple right. as, you know, hey, Dr. Evans, this is Julie. Mm -hmm. Right. And you right. say, Julie, you're at the dentist today. How can I help you? Right. Very simple verbal skills and questions that you can ask because they've never been asked questions like, um, how can I help you today? Every dentist goes in and starts with x-rays and exams and photographs and, and, and picks up the mirror and explorer. So you right. can ask them, how can I help you today? And they'll say, well, you know, I haven't had my teeth cleaned this year or, hey, I'm, I, my sister has been talking to me. I'd like to think about being mercury free or... Um, I just got to use my insurance this year, or I haven't seen a dentist in 10 years, whatever their reasons are, those are the important things to the patient. So those are the first things on the list that you got to write down and take care of, uh, not immediately, but in the process of developing the relationship. So like, let, ultimately... Let me ask you this. If you ask them, how can I help you, typically what kind of answers do you get? Just curious, I mean, being a fly on the wall. They, <laughs> well, you get all kinds of, of, of answers. Um, they, some people have been in um, other dental offices, and they say, well, you know, I'm, I'm here to, to uh, well, maybe not quite yet. Let, let me back off from that. When they say, how can they help me? say, well, you know, I've got this sore space on the top left, or I need a cleaning. But it's, it's the start of the conversation where what's important to the patient gets written down. It's imp what's important to the patient gets noted. It's their agenda, not yours. So I think that's the most important part is, is when, you, when you cover these certain questions, it's, you know, uh, Leslie, how can I help you? And, it's, it, and so you can also ask, once they tell you what's important to them, 
and you should write that down, you can go ask immediately, says, well, you know, what kind of dentist are you looking for? And all of a sudden, you, you open up a conversation into this um, uh, where the patient was, well, wait a minute, I thought all dentists were the same. You know, it starts, it starts putting some, some, some conversation on the table. They say, well, you know, I just need my teeth cleaned. Or, hey, you know, uh, I saw you online. I know you're, you're uh, a mercury-safe dentist, uh, or I know you specialize in cosmetics. You know, that's the kind of dentist they're looking for because if they think that all dentists are alike, that could be something that you open up the conversation because you know different. You're a little more, more experienced than that. But you can, you can take it even further. You can say, have you you know, had any bad experiences at the office, I mean at the dentist? So you can show compassion on your side because maybe they've got horror stories um, that you can kind of be on their side because it's all about the dentist. It's all about the patient. And right. the, con the conversation would revolve all around the patient at that time. That's amazing. So you start by, you know, making them the star and you are being introduced to the star and, and then you, who's at the service of the star, is asking them, how can I help you? And they start talking, and then you go a bit deeper, and you start, you know, you know, asking about their experiences and you know, various things to really understand. Like, oh, for example, what kind of dentist are you looking for, right? Yeah. Uh, to really understand what they have, because a lot of times you can't shift their thinking or help them till you understand their current set of. Um, I think uh, Shildini talks about consistency, the current set of thoughts they have in terms of what they need and what they want. Am I correct? Well, yeah, you're absolutely correct, because what you're trying to do is, is plant some seeds into, in, into the patient's subconscious thinking with a series of questions. And, you know, we, actually, we've developed uh, the top 10 new patient questions to, to go through. Some of them are um, exactly what they want, is to get them to reveal what their needs are, what their wants are, what are their desires, and and then you're just going to use your best option dental care to solve the patient's problems um, by the patient's way of thinking. Now, because you know, once once somebody says um, that's what I want, um, it's hard to change their mind because they do want to be consistent with with their previous commitment. Correct by Cialdini. Correct. Right. 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 So, but but it's a it, it, it's a process, Nara, and it's not something you just say, "Hey, I just got a few questions I want to." You know, when I ask a, a question, you know, have, have, have you, you know, Julie, have you ever had any bad experiences at the dentist? And they say, "Oh my gosh, yeah. When I was a kid, it was like no Novocaine. It was, or my, my this guy was taking my wisdom teeth out. He almost broke my jaw, and all." So you you, you are you are empathizing, you are being compassionate uh, in the moment with them. But the next question after that is this. It says, you know, Julie, let's, then I'd like your advice. What makes a good dentist then in your eyes? Mm -hmm. And you just casually ask them. And then they think, well, because this is just, this is, a, this is planned out. This is not, this is a process, Narn. It's not just something that happens by chance. When you say, Leslie, I understand then, then I'd like your advice. You know, what makes a good dentist, you know, in your eyes? That's a question I ask. Because at that point in time, they say, well, you know, hey, I need somebody who listens to me. I need somebody who's gentle and is honest with me, you know. So there's three things right there that if you just did those three things, you'd you have them for you, life. You, you, you got them. You've got them. You say, you know, you, you, I... Sometimes when they say, hey, you know, I need somebody who is painless, I need somebody who gives me some options, who's somebody who's pleasant, and I'll stop them right there and say, oh, my God, I was doing so well until you just said we had to be pleasant, you know, and the barriers just start coming down, you know, and, the, and they laugh and everything, and, and if, but, if, but if they do say, you know, I need somebody, a dentist who's painless, who is knowledgeable, who, who is honest with me. And and I may not joke around with him, but I'll say, listen, you know, Leslie, you've come to a very good office. Every one of these points uh, you just said that are important to you, we will do every one of them if that's all right with you. Right. And then she, and all of a sudden, in an instant, you are trustworthy. Right. 
And you don't Again, get you're asking that. their permission, right? I mean, that's the key thing. You're saying, is Absolutely. it okay for me to do these three things you asked of me? That's just one more victory for the patient. Right. Can you see it? Right. It's one more positive result for the patient. Now, an interesting thing happens here because studies have shown when you let the patient talk, when you let the patient talk a little bit more, studies have shown that that when you talk to someone, the longer you talk to them, the more you like that person. Right. So if you let the patient talk a little longer to you, the more they're going to like you. So that's all these things are from applied psychology. And it, Actually, it probably goes right along with uh, Cialdini's books, right? Right. Actually, you remind me one of the first books I read. It's uh, called How to Win Friends and Influence People by, uh, you know, Dale Carnegie. And, and Carnegie, he yeah. talks about it, right? He's like... If you want to win friends, be interested in them. You know, it sounds so, you know, simple. Like, you know, nobody cares about you. They care about themselves. So the more questions you ask, the more curious you are about what they want and what they think, the more they love you. You don't have to say a word. <laughs> Absolutely. So let me take this just one step further, because yeah. now that you've got somebody that says, yes, you know, I appreciate it. you would do all those things for me. Uh, that's what I want. Okay, now you've got somebody, you're on their side, and they are now trusting you. At some point in time, right after that, I ask another question. Now, this is just you know, it's just one of the top 10 new patient questions I ask. I ask them kind of off the cuff, how, how long are you going to live? And they're kind of startled by that, I think, and that's what I want. I, I want that pattern interrupt right there because they're at a different dentist office right now. When somebody's just asking questions and having a comfortable conversation like this, it's actually building an intelligence file that you're going to use during your case proposal. So when you say how long you're going to live, they're going to say, yeah, excuse me? <laughs> you know, I say, how long am I going to live? I said, yeah, how long are you going to live? Are your parents alive? Are your grandparents alive? Oh, so oh, my, you know, my granddad lived till he was 98, you know, and I'll just say something like, well, you've got good genes then. So when you're 98, are you going to have your teeth, Leslie? Mm -hmm. And almost invariably, Naren, they say, I plan to, you know, I said, right. well, then I need to put that in your plan, don't I? Mm -hmm. So now I got a patient that trusts me, who wants to be 98 years old with the best health they can be and have all their teeth. And if I go through my exam properly with all the seven diagnostic disciplines about sleep apnea and occlusal disease and perio and the biocompatibility of the materials we use and infections and pathology and all those things, I'm going to be able to have uh, a treatment plan that the patient is going to accept because they just told me. They trust me. They want to keep their teeth for a lifetime. They want to be as healthy as possible. We've got all the seven diagnostic disciplines that gives whole body dentistry between occlusal disease and sleep apnea and perio and the materials we use, I've got a treatment plan that I will develop that's going to be accepted by the new patient because they are being convinced by someone that they like and trust, which is not only me, but themselves, because now they're, they've got a part in, in the plan. And it's like you don't you don't fight the plan if you plan the fight, so to speak. You know what I mean? All right. So I need so, to dissect a few things you just said. So when you ask them how long you're going to live, and obviously it throws them right because they've never heard that question before. Not so for obviously the they're going to remember it exactly. You know they're going to remember it. But beyond that, by answering that question, they're trusting you because you won't tell somebody who you don't trust. You know, your wish for yourself and your health. Well, right. no. So, it, so you know, I've had. You're right. It adds. It gives them a little bit of a trust. It, it, it allows. You've built this trust over the last two minutes with a couple of questions. Uh, right. They're beginning to open up about their health. It gives them a safe place to talk about their health. Now, I'll tell you, uh, and I'll I'll tell this to some patients because Williamsburg has. Um, become more of a, a of a retirement uh, community uh, city in the past 20 years. So I get 55, 65 year old people coming into the practice, and I will talk to them about uh, uh, they need uh, they have a place where you could put a bridge or, or whatever. But some of them will say, you know, hey doc, you know, don't bother. I ain't going to live that long. 
you know, so it's important to get them to realize if they're going to be 98 years old, what's the quality that they want? It's like uh, retirement planning. There's some, you, things you've got to do today to get to where you want to be in your retirement fund, right? So, right. but the, but it's kind of a it's kind of a joke. But um, when somebody comes in and uh, into my practice and they're 65 years old and they said, "Don't worry about it, Doc. I you know I ain't going to live that long. Just don't worry about that part." Well, in my own practice, it's now 10, 15 years later, and those people are still around, and they you know they promised me they'd be dead, and they're not. I have to now fix those people, right? And they're on a, they're on a, a, a steady income, or they're living off to, off uh, retirement funds. So it upsets me to think that 15 years ago I allowed that to happen in my practice. Is it that 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 patch and repair kind of dentistry? Uh, you know, it's it, it's it's like okay, now they're 80. They've broken a tooth. They've done this. Now they need crowns, and who's paying for it? That they're not working anymore. They're right. dipping into in, into their savings. So, what kind of service was it for me 15 years ago to do that? That's why I've gone through all of these kind of mental gymnastics, Naren, to kind of figure out how to get people to buy into their future health, something that is going to be good for them in the future. Because I think it's a disservice for us to patch and repair. Um, people who are going to be 98 years old. And is my dentistry going to endure? Uh, I want it to. So when we talk to other dentists, that's another question that I ask them. I said, you know, what what kind of new patient grid do you have in your office from the conversations and the exam and the proposal and the agreements that you have with your patients? Um, and it's and, and no one has it set up. So I've uh, I've taken a long time just developing this in my own practice and it works it works extremely well because now you've got patients who like i said you know they 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 have helped you build this along um the entire way to develop a plan for their health when they're a lot older and it's you know it it they they accept the care because again you know you don't you don't sink the boat you help to build it's just like um they're they they they're buying into their health and our generation of these um what do they call them baby boomers right right um they they are um they've got more funds that are uh, kind of discretionary than ever before in history and right. Patients that are 55 and 60 years old, they're starting to fall apart in the first place. You know, the eyes and the knees go, and the mouth is not far behind. So, um, I think it's a, I think it's a, 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 a hell of a service to offer them care that's going to be in a total body sense. Uh, and I'm talking sleep apnea, occlusal disease, any pathology, periodontal disease is is the most prevalent chronic inflammatory disease on the planet. I so said we're as dentists, we're entrusted with this most powerful place on the body. We've got to be able to engage that new patient in 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 our own offices, and it's just it's just a, a, a grid that you have to develop to take them from first opportunity to accepting your treatment. And um, I'm, I like the way I do it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I do have a couple of questions. Um, why did you call it the grid? And and um, well, and then it's, it's, let's go beyond um, you know that first meeting. So let's go ahead. The the the, the, the grid is like you know uh, um, it's like the internet. The internet is, is is a grid of towers and cells and satellites. You know, if something goes down, everything stops. It's it's like an electrical grid on 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 the, uh, for the United States. You know, everybody's happy as long as the grid's functioning and 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 effective. But if if the grid goes down, you're out. You got people dying in houses that are too cold because they didn't have uh, electricity or or whatever. In the military, you know, my son is a, is a is a, a, a reconnaissance marines. Uh, he you know he he'll tell you. He says you don't go out on a mission or an objective. Or a situation and not know the grid. So the grid is is the pieces and parts 
that make everything together in the dental office as it flows. Um, so I, it just it just makes sense to me to, to to term it a grid because it's all interconnected, and if one part fails, you're done. You know, right. you you don't have people accepting twenty thousand dollar cases every month because you didn't you didn't connect the dots. <laughs> so so. I get it. I get it. Now, so there's a lot happening in that first visit, right? And how that visit is conducted and all the pieces, right? You know, walking side by side with the patient and introducing well, at the, the new the new patient visit. appointment, is that what you the new patient appointment? Yes. 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 And then then what happens? Like I'm just I would I would love to come and spend a day at your office and kind of see you in action, but I haven't done that yet. So uh Well, let me just uh, I'll tell you I'll tell you if, if you're going to put a grid in your office like this, it says there's five five steps and they are first of all the opportunity that you have at 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 uh, uh welcoming the new patient and and having them come into the office um to begin with. The second part is a conversation that you have with the patient. The third is the discovery where you actually look for the perio and the and the and the cavities and all the things that we know about, you know, how we fix teeth. And that that third part that is the mo- that is very important too. None of these none of these steps are are unimportant. The third the third step of discovering what this patient's got as far as missing teeth and 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 and, and orthodontics and things like that says you that's the step that discovery step is the step where you create your money. So and I, that's one of the things you you like to talk about. I mean, whether talk about it was time, money, and purpose and relationships that that you said you talked about on the on the podcast well right. in the discovery part where you actually do your physical exam uh, uh oral cancer exam and perio and dentition and all that you 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 write your check right then you create your money in that step it's called the discovery step you don't cash it quite then but if you're not accomplished in those seven diagnostic disciplines you're you know you're your average new patient value is created in that step, the discovery step. So the, the national average of new patient value, I think, is probably seventeen, eighteen hundred dollars on an average value. Uh, some good offices are getting three, four, five thousand dollars per average new patient value. Uh, for the last decade, my new patient average value has been like ninety-three, ninety-five hundred dollars average new patient value, and it's because they are a part and they want what what they have discussed with me. It says that's the thing I want. So you make you you create your money in that one step. Now you don't you don't get it until you do all the work. But if you don't create it in the first place, you don't have a hell of a chance of of of, of, of putting it in the bank later because it's just not going to be there. So the third step is the discovery. The fourth step is now what we used to call case presentation, but we call it the proposal because we want to propose a solution to the patient's problems that are acceptable by the patient's way of thinking. And when you when, and when it makes sense to the patient, the fifth step, which is the agreement, we don't call it financial arrangements anymore either because financial arrangements just involves, hey, uh, write the check here or give me a credit card or get on care, care credit or whatever. There's other agreements that have to be made on um, what you know, what kind of treatment is going to be done? Are we going to do quadrant treatments? Are we going to do single tooth by single tooth treatments? There's also another agreement on how the patient is going to come into your office, how the patient is going to agree to be on time for your appointments, how the patient is going to agree to pay promptly and in full. I mean, those are agreements too that need to be done. Once you have all five steps in line, all you have to do is do your quadrant dentistry and you put the money in the bank. But at the end of that, you've got patients that are just loving you to death, just loving you to death. And it's just, um, and that's another one of your your, your, your your premises is purpose, right? Right. It's like, my gosh, when you've got patients that just um, thank you, says, you know, I, I, you're looking at my health, not just my teeth. You know, it's that kind of thing that happens. God, this is amazing. This is, uh, you know, I'm just soaking this up. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the way you have, 
you know, design that five-star process and, uh, you know, and finally it comes down to serving people. I mean, it's doing what's good for them. And, uh, and I mean, like I, I talk to people, you know, the dentists who feel like, you know, um, cost, you know, I, I don't want to use the word, the word customer is your enemy, but it's just, you know, they, they are kind of resigned to the fact that these people can be amazing people to serve. And, uh, um, and, and you have built a practice you know, where the same person becomes a different person once they go through your grid, once they go through your process. And uh, not only do they pay, but really they appreciate it. They, 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 they are so grateful. You know, uh, you are doing them a service, and that's the way they feel, and that's the way they act. And I know because we manage your... Uh, you know, website and marketing and all of that stuff. And I know the reviews people write about you. You know, it just kind of, now that I talk to you, I understand why they write what they write. You know, it's, it's, uh, it makes sense to me. Um, it, I, it, I it, it. It, makes, uh, it makes sense to the patients too. Because right. if you just bring them in and tell them how you're going to fix their teeth, so if there's nothing more than, if you haven't brought anything more to the table, then here's what I'm going to do. Here, here's how much it's going to cost. Uh, sign up over here. Um, there's a guy down the street that's going to beat your price every time. Um, right. So it's, if, if, it's, if, you're, if you're only talking about money, you've lost your authority with that patient because nothing else is on the table. So when you, when you, you've got to engage the patients in those emotional things like, you know, I, 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 I'd like a dentist that's going to be honest with me. You know, how do you get a patient to actually open up enough that they're feel, they feel safe enough to tell you, I, I want a patient who, 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 who is gentle, who's going to be honest with me, who is knowledgeable. And then you say, you know, uh, oh, my gosh, I've got to be knowledgeable too, Leslie. I didn't know I'd have to be knowledgeable. That breaks the barriers down, right? And then you say, right. Leslie says, no, I am kidding, you know. You have come to a very good office, and and these these three things that are important to you, Leslie, we will do every one of them, uh, if that's all right with you. And you know that you know in Cialdini's book again, uh, you want that consistency with commitment. Is you get a, you get the patient to say yes uh, to what they want, and they will continue to say yes what they want. And so it's not. I don't think I don't think Cialdini's book is so much about manipulation. It's just using applied psychology to kind of in the behavioral sciences like that to actually help the patient reveal their wants, their needs, their desires, so you can build that intelligence file to serve them better. So right. there you have it. <laughs> no, absolutely. And I loved what you talked about agreement. I mean, you know, I was asking you, remember yesterday or a few days ago when I was talking to you, do you have a problem with, you know, people coming back? And he said, no, I don't. And I said, that's surprising because I know a lot, that's one of the issues that a lot of practices struggle with. And, and you were talking about agreement, right? You, you mean, like you said, remember, here are the three things you want. I make a commitment to giving this to you. Are you okay with that? Yes. Here are the three things I want. I want you to show up to your appointment on time. I want you to pay your bills on time. You know, so now they're making a commitment to their end of the bargain. And it's not just about you know how big the you know the fee is. It's really about you know that commitment to the relationship. And you're very upfront and clear. And it is about you know, the relationship. The yeah, exactly. That's 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 the one thing we wanted to cover today. It is the relationship that you have with the patient. It's mutual respect. Somebody who cancels an appointment on you, it's rude, it's disrespectful. Right. Um, oh my gosh. So, and somebody who doesn't pay you for what you have done for them, it's like so my you know, my collections have been for past decade have been 100%. Um huh. I very rarely, you know, something's got to break down for somebody not to show up uh, at an appointment. They'll be running down the hall panting. <laughs> it's a time I hope I'm not late for my appointment, you know. But but because every patient, every new patient that comes into our practices have been trained by all the other dentists they've ever been to. So you've got to retrain them. The new patient right. grid has all of those things inside of it when you take a look at what opportunity you've got, the kind of conversation that you can have with the patient, the diagnostics that you're going to discover with that patient together. 
the the proposal of treatment that that uh, makes sense to the patient, and then the agreements that you have to carry on. And that overall grid, uh, anything can fall apart inside that grid. But boy, when you got a staff who understands that you take care of people, not just teeth. Um, my gosh, it's a pleasure to go and come to work every day. I'm, you know, I break into a carefree shuffle going down the hallway almost every single day. Got, got people who understand why we come to work. Right. Right. I have one question. Um, um, now, does this work with um, people who are younger, maybe the Gen X, Gen Y? I mean, I would think it would, but just want your experience on it. Uh, absolutely. I know. I know. I talked about the people who are 55, 65, that they're starting to, you know, get worried about uh, things are going wrong. I need a total knee replacement. I need this. But I can't tell you, Naren, how many people, the young kids with young families, are calling, saying, "I talked to my other dentist over here, and he was going to put a, a mercury filling in here, and I questioned him about it, and he said, oh, no, the American Dental Association says they're perfectly fine.' You know, we 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 put them in all the time. I've got a bunch of them in my mouth. See, so they, don't worry. Well, some of these young people." They see their parents and their grandparents starting to fall apart dentally, and they've they've read they're becoming their they're uh, they're becoming like their own health advocate. They do not want their children to have those kinds of experiences, so they are becoming more aware of their own health and how dentistry impacts their whole body health too. So, the the younger um, families are calling up wanting the same thing. The older people um, have never, ever been presented about why why your teeth look like this. What happens uh, with your mercury fillings uh, if you leave them in and you have, you've got a chronic exposure to the mercury? What happens with the teeth if you pull them all out? Um, things like that, they need an education on just like the young, younger families need educations also. So it's not just people who are starting to fall apart. The younger families are because of of uh, the last 15 years with the internet they can research things and they are trying to understand for themselves um what an implant would be like rather than having a root canal what would be about replacing these teeth rather than having the teeth kind of change positions and get all out of malocclusion shape and things like that so uh that this kind of this kind of uh, relationship attitude uh, with a relationship model um uh, is for it can be for anybody. It is not a niche kind of thing. It's not like, hey, I need something to boost my practice. Let me learn about implants. Hey, I need to learn about sedation dentistry because I need to boost my production. These other these th- the, the ways to grow the practice where you get more new patients is just one way. The re- the, the other two relationship capital. Right. If if I want to learn more, doctor, we have a lot of listeners, and um, you know, if I want to learn more about what you are doing, is there a way I can, you know, get to know more and uh, maybe even get in touch with you? Like, um, um, any sure. Or? Um, well, we've got uh, uh, the website is thebiocompatibledentist.com, dot com, um, and we've got certain things that 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 we do that we share. Um, you can also call the office and talk to Rachel or talk to Donna or talk to myself um, on the biocompatible office, and that that telephone number is 757-220-1848. And we've got certain certain online programs and, and uh, products that might help you out. Um, and we do have we do take on uh, uh, a couple of coaching clients every year also. So. That's always available too, but uh, it's it, it it's 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 good for a dentist to kind of just be exposed to this idea that it's a process. It's just not my front desk answers the phone and I I tell them what they need and then take payment over there. It it's a process. It's a grid. It's a five step formula that can be analyzed and developed in your office to make things go smoothly. So maybe somebody will call. I hope they do. Yeah, absolutely. I think they would. Um, 
So the website is thebiocompatibledentist.com, right? T H E Bio B I O compatible C O M P A T I B L E dentist.com, correct? Correct. And the phone number again, please? 757 220 1848. 757 220 1848. And they should ask for Donna or, or Rachel? Or Rachel. Okay, perfect. I mean, I, I had amazing amount of fun, Doctor, and I learned so much about, <laughs> you know, why you are so successful. And I was wondering, you know, how why is your average, you know, new patient value is $9,300? And now I understand why. You know, it just makes sense to me. And uh, I was also wondering how come your patients love you and say those amazing things. And again, now I get it. Well, um, yeah, I'm also handsome, too, you know. I'm, 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 <laughs> Uh, you know, I tall, I'm tall and handsome too, Narin. It's just not. All right, that absolutely. was a joke. And, <laughs> and, and absolutely, and, and I think you're also very proud of your son in you know in the military. So, you know, anyways, um, that's that's another thing I'm sure you look at, you know you're very proud of. And uh, is, is he but, is he you? Is he home now, or is he? Is he no, he's a, he's in Okinawa. He's training other Marines uh, in Okinawa because uh, there's still things that have to happen for for our security. Uh, right. But you're right. You know, he's 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 dedicated uh, dedicated quite a bit of his life to uh, helping all of us um, in our lifestyles. So yeah, right. I'm I'm very proud of him. You bet. Yeah, and I'm glad you got that name grid from him because. Uh... That, that's amazing, <laughs> and I think it makes sense, and I understand. Uh, uh, now, I mean, you have given me a totally different set, set of appreciation for the word grid. I, I didn't understand that before this call, so uh, thank you very much, <clears throat> Dr. Dr. Evans. Um, I really enjoyed myself today, and I'm sure a lot of the listeners would have learned a lot and would have a lot of fun. So uh, thank you again for taking the time to talk to me and, uh, you know, share your wisdom. And again, I guess it's overnight success. How many years in the making? All the wisdom. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's been my pleasure to talk with you too, as always, Naren. We sit down for breakfast or we talk on the phone. It's, it's, uh, it's always a pleasure to be with you too. So I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for listening to one more episode of Growing Dentist. And I look forward to seeing you on the next one. Have a wonderful day.